Hello everyone, my name is um, Sharif Shaki. I'm going to be talking today about uh, inflammatory bowel disease. I hope you will find this uh, presentation helpful and assist you in your learning uh, process and your practice as well. So inflammatory bowel disease um, is a chronic, progressive, and relapsing inflammatory condition of, this, of the bowel, including the small bowel and the colon as well. It results in huge disability of the patient. And although the precise etiology of inflammatory bowel disease is unknown, the current research model suggests that an environmental trigger causes disease in a host, and that host is predisposed due to intrinsically impaired immunity. Environmental factors suggested to play a role in either the cause or the course of the IBD include external agents such as cigarette smoking, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or agents that are present within the host itself, for example, commensal pa pathogenic organisms that um, comprise that are comprising part of the intestinal microbiome. Also, some environmental factors, such as prior appendectomy, had been thought to be playing a greater or lesser role in disease. For example, it's thought to be um, associated with less ulcerative colitis um, in patients. Besides also to the host immunologic predisposing an environmental factor, the native microbiome, as I spoke earlier, uh, may be also playing a significant role in the pathogenesis of inflammatory bowel disease. There is a spectrum of inflammatory bowel disease. At one end is mucosal ulcerative colitis, and the other end is Crohn's disease, and these are the two main topics I will focus on today. And in between, there is inflammatory bowel disease unclassified. This is when the clinical features, manifestations, as well as uh, endoscopic biopsy are not inclusive um, of one of the other and the terminology indeterminate colitis is reserved to after the colon is out and pathology report uh, document uh, such diagnosis and it is also by model mode of presentation so there is a peak in the earlyhood in the first two or three decades, and there is another peak in the uh, fifth and sixth decades of surgery. Mucosal ulcerative colitis is an idiopathic recurrent inflammatory process of the colon. It affects the colonic mucosa mainly, and it starts in the rectum and spreads proximally. As we discussed earlier, the etiology is multifactorial and it includes impaired mucosal immune regulation as well as environmental factors, as I alluded earlier. The symptoms of mucosal ulcerative colitis includes bowel movement frequency, loose bowel movements, sometimes bloody diarrhea, in association with cramps, urgency, tenesmus, and the worsening, which is the urge incontinence. And these patients, as you may know already, they will know where are the bathrooms around wherever they work or they go to the mall. They will always know where the bathrooms uh, are located. There are also systemic signs associated with mucosal ulcerative colitis, and these include fatigue, malaise, in addition to weight loss and fever. The fever is due to the inflammatory um, underlying condition. And because of the cramps of the dominant pain and the diarrhea, in addition to the losing, in addition to losing important nutritional factors from this, the patient also try to avoid eating. Therefore, they are anemic, they are hyperalbuminemic, resulting in the fatigue and the malaise and the weight loss. In addition to that, there are also extra intestinal manifestations that almost includes the majority of the body as depicted in this diagram. And this uh, extra intestinal manifestation applies on both ulcerative colitis as well as Crohn's disease. 
The diagnosis, as in any other condition, starts with a good history and thorough physical exam. Investigate the signs and symptoms as mentioned above. Ask about any rectal problems because you want to rule out Crohn's disease. General examinations, including the extra-intestinal manifestation, as well as in a rectal exam to look for signs of Crohn's disease and to assess the anal sphincter muscle. And this is followed by colonoscopy with obtaining bio tissue biopsies in order to confirm the diagnosis with histopathological evaluation. During colonoscopy, you will find continuous mucosal inflammation. There are no skip lesions, as these are features of uh, Crohn's disease. As I mentioned earlier, it usually starts in the rectum and progress proximally. And this will play a key in uh, defining the extent of ulcerative colitis, as I will show later. Therefore, it can be basically localized to the rectum or it can be uh, spread in the whole colon and the rectum. When we do colonoscopy, we have to intubate the ileum and obtain biopsies and evaluate it. Sometimes it will look, it will look inflamed, and this is basically described as backwash ileitis. Uh, and the biopsy shows that there is no evidence of Crohn's disease. In long-standing uh, ulcerative colitis, the colon becomes foreshortened and it loses its hostra and it looks like a lead pipe on the imaging. And this is because of full thickness hypertrophy, although the inflammation, as I mentioned, is localized to the mucosa, but the whole wall now is hypertrophied and it is considered as end-stage disease. When biopsies are obtained, it shows acute, on top of chronic, inflammation. The inflammation is localized to the lamina propria, and it is associated with distorted Cripps architecture, and there is no granulomas, as granulomas is a main feature of Crohn's disease, although it is not always present in all Crohn's disease biopsies. Imaging and the workup of ulcerative colitis includes CT scans, CT enterography, MR, MR enterography, as well as capsule endoscopy. And as you can see, there is overlap between the workup for the uh, ulcerative colitis as well as Crohn's disease because we want to make sure of making the right and precise diagnosis. This will allow us also to identify the extent of the disease as well as ruling out the stigmata of Crohn's disease. Serology workup includes ESR, C-reactive protein, as well as the newly used fecal calpoprotein. And it's a measure of colonic mucosal macrophage activity that may predict and follow the trajectory of the disease flares. So a falling calpo, calpo, uh, calproprotectin may predict actually mucosal healing. In addition to that, there is also the Prometheus antigen testing panel which is reserved for cases that are difficult to diagnose and it can help differentiate between ulcerative colitis as well as Crohn's disease. Any patient that presents with colitis has to be worked up to rule out infectious, uh, other infectious colitides. Stool ovum and parasites has to be ruled out, specifically Giardia which are usually found in uh, persons who had been recently hiking or camping, and other common forms of uh, colitis. These are the common forms, could be cytomegalovirus colitis, and when you do this in the left hand side figure here shows in the bottom, you can see the punched out ulcer that are very uh, characteristic of cytomegalovirus. On the right hand figure here, you can see a picture showing the pseudomembranous colitis in Clostridium difficile colitis. This has to be ruled out.
classification of ulcerative colitis had been proposed by the Montreal classification and it depends on the severity of the disease as well as the extent of the disease. As you see, the extent could be lo uh, localized only to the rectum or it can be left-sided, which includes the rectum and the left side of the colon. And once it goes beyond the spinic flexure proximally toward the cecum, it's called pan colitis. The severity could be S0 and 1, 2, to 3. 0 means the patient is in clinical remission. I will explain that later. And S1 means it is mild disease. And we rely on some criteria, and I will discuss this in details. Then these criteria are clinical, biochemical, imaging, and, and also uh, patient status. So when the patient has less than four bowel movements a day and no serologic or systemic signs of inflammation, that's called mild disease. If the patient develops more than four but less than six, and some signs of inflammation, that's called moderate. When the patient has bloody stool, more than six a day, with tachycardia, low grade temperature, low hemoglobin, and increase in ESR, that's called severe disease. And from there, beyond that, we can, we'll find that these are described as toxic or fulminant colitis. And when they are associated with dilated colon, they are called toxic megacolon, and I will also uh, uh, explain that for you. Medical treatment of ulcerative colitis includes goals and endpoints. You want to induce remission, and you want to maintain that remission, trying to avoid reliance on other medication that has significant side effects and cannot be used in long term, such as steroids. In addition to that, you want to improve the quality of life of the patient. And minimizing inflammation is associated with minimized risk of neoplasia. And we will have a section that we're going to talk about this in details. What's remission is the absence of symptoms and associated with mucosal healing. And maintenance requires ongoing medical treatment. This table here shows different classes of medical treatment used in treating ulcerative colitis. The amino salicylates, topical corticosteroids, thioprins, biological agents, systemic corticosteroids, and calcineurin inhibitors. There is always dosing associated with each of these group, and some of them requires loading dose followed by a maintenance dose. And in general, there are two competing therapeutic strategies, namely the traditional bottom-up approach, which is an additive approach. In this approach, you start with a less expensive, less effective medication and sequentially add another medication from another group until the desired clinical endpoint is reached or achieved. On the other hand, the top-down approach is a subtractive approach in which strategy you start by initially placing the patient on a more aggressive therapist in order to achieve rapid remission. And this usually is done with a more aggressive disease. And then the agents are sequentially weaned off until we find a proper level where we can maintain the remission. And this is always, of course, is balanced. Uh, it's a, uh, this also, uh, this is actually is a balance between efficacy and toxicity of the used medical uh, therapeutic agents. On the left side here, we have a proposed bottom-up approach for mild colitis, mild to moderate. And on the left side here, this is another proposed approach for severe colitis. Indications of surgery and ulcerative colitis include refractory disease. What does this mean? It means that the, the disease is not responding to any of the medical treatments we tried, or the disease is responding, but it's steroid dependent, which cannot be given for long term. Or the patient developed complication of a long term use of steroids or another agent.
Also, intolerance to medical therapeutic agents or developing side effects from aggressive, highly efficient medical ag uh, therapeutic agents but have the high toxic profile. Or there are contraindications in the patient that prevent from using biologic agents such as past history of TB or some sort of blood malignancy or other medical disease such as in liver which, uh, is, be, is, which is used in meta, uh, metabolizing these agents or growth retardation when children and, and adolescents are uh, experiencing such disease or neoplasia. Alternatively, patients may develop complications of, coli of ulcerative colitis like flares or develop toxic colitis, fulminant colitis, or perforation and bleeding. This table here is modified from true love criteria. And as you can see, it divides, it provides a severity scale, including mild disease, severe disease, and toxic or fulminant disease. And that scale depends on the number of stools per day, having blood in it or not, temperature, pulse, hemoglobin, ESR, and x-rays. And I will explain in a second when you have such patient, what uh, are you going to do in the hospital and what are your end goal and end points? So with a, when a patient presents with severe ulcerative colitis, that patient usually requires admission. Once the patient is admitted, a complete and thorough evaluation is going to uh, take place and includes a multitude of aspects. In addition to the clinical examination, Serology is going to be obtained, including ESR, CRP, complete blood count, as well as complete metabolic um, profile is going to be obtained. As we discussed earlier, always rule out other infectious cause of colitis, which is C. diff, CMV, and ovine parasite. At this point, usually the patient is under the medical service. And then an attempt of conservative management is uh, undertaken. So the patient is made nil per os, hydrated, and then initiate rescue treatment and treat infections if found like CMV or C. diff and close observation and monitoring of the patient has to take place. The rescue treatment, you are trying to get the disease under control. You are trying to suppress the peak of the inflammation in the colon and its effect on the body in general. Therefore, you're using all the big guns. You start using intravenous steroids. Usually, it is 20 milligram of uh, Solicortef and this is gi given um, every eight hours. And recently, the biologic agents had been used also in, re in the rescue treatment in addition to cyclosporins. These are all made according to guidelines and protocols from the American Gastroenterology Association, and usually a gastroenterologist is involved in, um, in leading the management of these patients. Observation includes symptoms like abdominal pain, frequency of bowel movements, the consistency, and including blood or not, distension, as well as the systemic symptoms, fatigue, exhaustion, and tired, tiredness. Monitoring of vital signs, including the heart rate, respiratory rate, and blood pressure is very important. As I showed earlier in the true love criteria, heart rate and respiratory, if there is an increase in heart rate, this is a suggestion of uh, deterioration of the condition, even if the patient is otherwise stable. And biochemistry and laboratory monitoring includes inflammatory markers as well as blood counts as well as albumin. Radiographic follow-up includes CT scan which is usually ordered at the, uh, at, 
during patient admissions, but during hospital stay, it is okay to order serial uh, abdominal x-rays to follow up on the uh, diameter of the colon. The upper right uh, x-ray here depicts severely inflamed colon with the uh, thumb print sign from the edematous mucosa. And the lower left one here shows a dilated colon, which almost approaching toxic megacolon. Just uh, because I mentioned the megacolon, uh, you need to know, to remember that uh, you need to make sure that the potassium and magnesium are um, well repleted and in the normal range. And hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia may predispose to colonic distension. Also, anticholinergic, antidiarrheal, and narcotics should be avoided in this case, as they can lead to worsening colonic atony and dilation. If you had a patient with colonic dilation and fever more than 38 and heart rate more than 100 and or 120, depending on which, whatever, whichever criteria you are using, with some leukocytosis, then you are, this is an emergency situation. This is called toxic megacolon, which basically combines the criteria of fulminant colitis or toxic colitis in addition to a dilated colon um, it is so diseased, it is so sick that it became atonic and is getting dilated and you should not wait for surgical intervention until it perforates because perforation adds more morbidity and actually increases the risk of mortality in the post-operative recovery. So this is a call for emergent surgical intervention. So what prompts surgical intervention? You want to avoid catastrophic situations. You want to avoid perforation. You want to avoid sepsis as well as bleeding. Therefore, you have to have an endpoint that should be achieved or reached within end time. And this is and this is justify and this justifies the goal directed therapy while the patient is admitted under such condition. And toward that end. Usually the protocol dictate that duration of rescue therapy takes between three and five days. Colorectal surgery should be consulted uh, in a timely manner and you, it's better to be done earlier than later. And usually these patients should be approached in a multidisciplinary uh, manner in which there are standardized guidelines or protocols that the gastroenterology, internal medicine, and the colon rectal surgery are aware of. So all are speaking the same language and all on the same page, all are providing the same information to the patient so there is no conflicting facts. And at this point, it is very important to emphasize that surgery is not a failure. Surgery is a treatment modality when it is indicated. The goal of surgical management is removing the diseased colon, improving patient condition, getting the patient out of that inflammatory condition, getting the patient out of that catabolic phase, as well as restoring gastrointestinal continuity in the right time. This can be done in an elective or semi-elective fashion or emergent fashion, depending on the patient presentation. This can also be done in one of three forms, one stage, two stage, or three stage procedure. In one stage procedure, the colon and the rectum are removed. Restoration of the gastrointestinal continuity is achieved by creating a pouch from the distal ileum called ilia J pouch and that is anastomosed to the inner canal without a protective ileostomy. That's done in an elective setting in a very healthy patient with the good nutritional parameters and there are no concerns regarding healing of the staple line or the anastomotic lines and this is very important to consider when you are embarking on such a um, procedure. The majority of us don't do one stage these days. On the contrary, two-stage procedure includes removing the colon and the rectum, creating the pouch, creating the ileal pouch in anastomosis, but protecting the pouch with a diverting loop leostomy. 
and then the diverting loop leostomy at the second stage can be closed and the pouch is basically put back to GI continuity and in circuit and becomes functioning. This is usually done in elective setting, in a healthy patient with a good nutritional parameters and still no concerns regarding healing of the staples and the anastomotic lines. Three-stage procedure is usually the procedure that's used in urgent and emergent setting where the patient is malnourished, on significant amount of medication, and there's huge concern regarding the healing capacity of the patient. In that procedure, we usually remove the colon first, leave the rectum in situ, and create an end ileostomy. I'll emphasize on that in a little bit. Leaving the rectum in situ minimize the operative time in a patient that is a very high risk and you want to get them off the table as fast as possible. Also, if you leave the rect if you remove the rectum, that, that may hinder the future restoration of intestinal continuity by in creating the pouch in a, in a later stage where the pelvis is hostile and not allowing proper dissection. In the inflammatory condition, when the patient is very sick, protectomy may be also associated with increased intraoperative bleeding and risk the in injury of the autonomic nerves. So the decision-making process includes how the patient presented, the medication that the patient was taking. For example, if the patient was taking 20 milligrams of, pre of daily uh, daily 20 milligrams of prednisone or more for the last month or more prior to admission, then this puts the patient at risk of healing problems. Therefore, you don't want to create a pouch at that time. If the patient was on biologics, same thing applies. Anemia and poor nutritional parameters also are associated with poor outcomes. Narcotic dependency is an indirect surrogate indicating that this patient is not ready from the healing standpoint for creating a pouch at this point and there is a high association of post-operative complication in addition to any comorbidities as in any other case. So with these factors in mind healing capacity of surgical wounds and stable lines and anastomotic lines are very poor and this will risk leak of the anastomotic lines as well as pelvic sepsis in up to 20 percent which will reflect in serious short-term complications pelvic sepsis which requires multiple operations in a patient that's already sick with very poor physiological reserve and may ultimately result in reoperative pouch surgery, which is another major abdominal surgery. It's reoperative pelvic surgery with associated with its associated morbidity up to fifty percent. In addition to long term sequela of the sepsis, even if it is fixed, that is associated with poor pouch function, more frequent bowel movement, poor sensation, poor continence, and perhaps strictures. So it's better to avoid all of this rather than dealing with it. Therefore, decision-making process should be done wisely and properly based on the factors that we discussed earlier. So what are the surgical options for ulcerative colitis? So basically, if you remove the diseased colon, the patient should be cured. It's unlike Crohn's disease. Surgery does not cure Crohn's disease, as I will talk later. So total proctocolectomy and endoleostomy is the treatment for, or is the cure for ulcerative colitis. If we're going to think of restoring the gastrointestinal continuity, which had become commonly performed nowadays, then we're going to do total proctocolectomy and aerial pouch in anastomosis. However, we're going to do this in two stages. 
or three stages, as I explained earlier, depending on the factors and patient presentation as discussed. So if the patient is elective or semi-elective, not on high dose of steroids, not on multiple biologic agents, with a good nutrition, not in toxic colitis condition or flare, then you may consider two-stage procedure in which you take the colon and the rectum, create the pouch and anastomose it to the anal canal and protect it with diverting loop pleostomy. If the patient has presented with severe form of colitis, toxic fulminant or toxic megacolon, the patient is sick, the patient has been on um, multiple courses of steroids, had been steroid dependent or on high dose of biologic, then three stage uh, procedure is very judicious in such conditions. So the pouch is created from the terminal ileum, which is basically you fold after you transect the distal rectum adds what's called the anal transitional zone. A loop of bowel is folded on itself like a letter J and is connected to each other. And then it is anastomosed to the anal canal with a stapler. Now I'd like to discuss some special considerations in management of chronic ulcerative colitis. And I'm going to mention some historical stuff that could you that you may find useful in your practice in case you uh, you need it. Sometimes or occasionally the patient will present in a very very poor condition. The patient is toxic has almost sepsis, the colon is very friable, that may perforate and spill stool in the abdominal cavity, and the patient will not tolerate big abdominal surgery such as colectomy. Or in a pregnant patient that is se severely sick, at this point you can just go in and you can create diverting loop pleostomy to put the colon out of circuit, and then you create a blowhole colostomy where you can vent the colon and decompress it to avoid or treat um, megacolon. Nowadays it's really needed, but if it is life-saving. Now, when three-stage procedure is indicated in which the colon is going to be removed and and the leostomy is going to be created and the rectus sigmoid stump is going to be left behind. In certain patients when they are very malnourished, toxic, with a very poor general condition and debilitated, the concern about the blowout of the rectus sigmoid stump is high. Therefore, as a matter of fact, we either implant it through the, the abdominal wall in the subcutaneous fat or you can even mature it as mucus fistula to the skin. This is, you're trying to avoid a dreadful complication in a patient that's already sick with poor physiological reserve and cannot tolerate another hit. So this is another um, a pro, a technique or another way you can uh, keep in mind when dealing with the rectus sigmoid stump in um, the very diseased patient. And last but not least, at the time of pouch creation with proctectomy, pelvic dissection is very important. Why? Because the safety of hypogastric nerves are very important to preserve the neurological slash sexual function. From the chronicity of inflammation, the hypogastric nerves, when they are passing from the abdomen to the pelvis at the pelvic brim, they are drawn very close to the rectum. And there is high risk of injury during dissecting the rectum and in entering the pelvis. Therefore, 
many uh, surgeons advocate intra mesorectum dissection versus starting in the total mesorectal excision plane as in rectal cancer from the beginning and the majority usually will start intramesenteric they start inside the mesentery and once they pass the pel uh, the sacral promontory or the pelvic brim they will drop down back to the uh, and join the TME plane and continue dissection of uh, the rectum again that's to um, make sure the hypogastric nerves are kept uh, safe and away from harm to preserve sexual function that was in brief um, chronic ulcerative colitis medical management indication for surgery elective versus emergent stages of dealing uh, st uh, operative stages of surgery one stage versus two and three stages and the benefits of each one of them and removing the colon and the rectum re removing the disease colon and rectum basically cure the disease it's the restoration of gastrointestinal continuity because people don't like to live with permanent ileostomy that added the ileal j pouch technique and the ileal j pouch has lots of an uh, stable line as well as an astomotic line with the inner canal therefore careful decision making about timing of creation of the pouch when the patient is ready physiologically is very important and at the end we discussed a special uh, consideration like the blue hole colostomy and the uh, management of the rectosigmoid stump and pelvic dissection when we are performing the proctectomy Crohn's disease is the other side of the spectrum of inflammatory bowel disease again it is inflammatory condition of unknown uh, etiology but mostly results from immune dysregulation in the background of environmental factors it is a transmural process the opposite of ulcerative colitis which is only uh, localized to the mucosa this one is full thickness process and it can affect any portion of the gastrointestinal tract starting from the mouth to the anus but most commonly located in the terminal ileum and cecum uh, followed by the colon we need to know that Crohn's disease is incurable unlike ulcerative colitis when you remove the diseased tissue the colon and the rectum it is cured in Crohn's disease it is not cured it's associated with variable course a range from acute attack to chronic underlying inflammation it can have few flares or it can have with long periods of remission into very severe and debilitating and unrelenting conditions The manifestations of Crohn's disease includes abdominal pain and cramps, diarrhea, gastrointestinal bleeding, and variable presentations that depends on the transmural nature of the inflammatory process, which could result in perforation or fistulization with any hollow organ or the skin, or fibrostenotic uh, stenosing uh, nature, such as stricturing. And this also can cause a spectrum of obstructive symptoms. Classification of Crohn's disease depends on the age of diagnosis, the location of the disease, the behavior or the, or the phenotype of the disease, and for that there was Vienna classification that was later updated to Montreal classification of Crohn's disease. Why do we need to know classifications? Because it is standardized language among gastroenterologists and colorectal surgeons, and it helps us to evaluate the disease and to evaluate the management of the disease on a medical basis as well as surgical basis so a1 when disease starts below 17 years a2 between 17 and 40 a3 above 40 and then location of the disease as well as the behavior of the disease l1 disease is terminal ileum disease which 
basically includes involvement of the lower third of the small bowel plus or minus the cecum. L2 is a colonic disease, which is between anywhere between the cecum and the rectum without ileal involvement. L3 is ileocolonic disease, which as it describes itself, includes the terminal ileum as well as the colon, not the cecum. L4 disease involves upper GI disease, and this is usually located anywhere, any point proximal to the ileum. And it can coexist with distal disease, so that you, can, you can add L4 to L1 or L4 to L2. The behavior of disease is described as B1, which is inflama inflammation without stricture, formation, or penetration. B2, which is stricturing disease. B3, which is penetrating disease, which results in fistulization. And P is a modification that signifies perianal involvement. And up to 80% of the inflammatory disease will evolute and become a penetrating or stricturing disease. However, about 15 to 20% of the disease may change its location. So the behavior or the phenotype may change in the majority of the cases, but the location usually remains the same. Disease severity also is very important to understand. Nowadays, as a surgeon, you need to speak the, gastro the gastroenterology language. You need to understand how they see these patients and how they treat these patients because you need to discuss the, the proper timing of indication for surgery. So there, are, there have been a composite of indices relying on signs and symptoms as well as endoscopic features and findings that are used to tell us the severity of the disease. As a surgeon, you need to memorize them, but you just need to understand that they exist and they include the signs and the symptoms of the disease. Crohn's disease activity index, Harvey Bradshaw index, as well as Crohn's disease endoscopic index are, an exa are examples of uh, such indices that are used to classify the severity. Although incurable disease, but medical treatment had been used trying to control the disease, inducing and maintaining remission in a way similar to the ulcerative colitis, but different perhaps in medications used, and also prevent progression because you want to avoid complication and decrease it. And remember, surgery does not cure Crohn's disease. Surgery only deals with the sequela of Crohn's disease. Similar groups exist in the medical armamentarium of treating Crohn's disease, including the aminosalicylic compounds, steroids, immunomodulators, as well as the biologic agents. Aminosalicylates are of limited value in inducing and maintaining remission, but they can be helpful. The steroids successfully induce remission, but they have short and long-term adverse effects. And they are mainly used in management of acute episodes, as we discussed in ulcerative colitis. Same thing happens here, too. You saw by intravenous uh, steroids while you are trialing a biologic agent or only steroids and monitor the response of the patient. The immunomodulators in Crohn's disease um, have limited use in induction of remission but successfully used in maintaining that remission when the patient responds. And they are not usually offered as monotherapy but more likely to be uh, involved or included in a dual therapy. The biologic agents, uh, we are um, with the 
advent of technology and research, we are getting now an armamentarium of just biologic agents that are being used for in the management of inflammatory bowel disease in general, as well as Crohn's disease uh, specifically. And these can be used in inducing and maintaining remission, usually used in moderate to severe disease. However, uh, you need to balance and know, be familiar of the efficacy and the safety uh, profile because uh, toxicity uh, side effects varies among the different medication uh, modalities. As discussed earlier, same here on Crohn's disease, you can medically um, manage the disease in a step-up approach. We'll use simple drugs, usually as effective with less toxic profile and escalation happens as needed and the process is repeated until you achieve disease control. On the other side, when the disease is starting aggressive and severe with the complication, uh, sometimes this requires aggressive management. So you start with more effective medication uh, in order to decrease exacerbation, hospitalizations, as well as hoping, hopefully, avoid operations. But this medication has toxic, uh, prof high toxic profile, and the process is repeated until the disease is controlled. When you think of the top-down approach, you need to understand that these are very strong immune, uh, immune suppressing medications. Therefore, certain type of infection, malignancies, and uh, has to be ruled out prior to initiating these medications. And their hype, their sorry, and their also toxicity profile is high in terms of infections, malignancy, hypersensitivity reactions, arthralgia, cytopenia, and autoimmune liver disease, as well as heart failure. And this, what I meant by saying initially, one of the indications for surgical management is intolerance to the medical treatment. If a patient develop one of these uh, side effects, they cannot be um, placed on them. Therefore, the disease will activate and surgery is indicated at that point. Hence, surgery does not, is not viewed as failure, rather a modality of treatment. So Crohn's disease is a complex and heterogeneous disease. An in-depth thought process needs to be implemented. It has many overlapping factors with concurrent medications. And surgery has consequences in Crohn's disease. And one should think two or three steps down the way so you can plan properly and don't burn any bridge. And thorough evaluation of each patient includes history, condition upon presentation, medication the patient is taking or had been taking, and nutritional condition. So clinical data, laboratory studies, radiological investigation, as well as endoscopic findings in the current admission or the last colonoscopy that was done, and histologic features. This will enable you to identify the type of the disease, the location and the extent of the disease, severity of the disease, association of anorectal disease, prior surgical resection, and all of this will enable you for proper planning. It's important to recognize that if multidisciplinary approach is important in rectal cancer, it is at least as important, if not more needed in Crohn disease patients because of the mentioned uh, factors. The indications of surgery includes failure of medical treatment or complications of the disease, such as tricturing or fistulization, abscess or neoplasia. Similar to ulcerative colitis, emergent causes include perforation, bleeding, and toxic colitis. Management of toxic colitis in Crohn's disease is pretty much similar to ulcerative colitis, so I will I will not um, 
talk much about it in this section. And the goals of the surgical management of Crohn's disease, number one, the ideal timing of surgery is very important. Often patients are so determined to avoid surgery that they ultimately suffer with a severe decline in their overall health and well-being. So timing is very important to avoid worsening of the health condition, avoiding developing malnutrition and weight loss, or the need of constant steroid-dependent courses or management because all of this can affect the outcome. Once you think of surgery in a Crohn's disease patient, you have to optimize the patient condition as much as you can. This may need hospital admission, as well as preoperative total parental nutrition to optimize nutritional condition. And you have to think of the proper surgery and the proper surgical approach in order to decrease postoperative complication. Also, because surgery does not cure Crohn's disease, it just deals with the sequela and the complication of Crohn's disease or its medical treatment, a bowel preservation approach or bowel conservative approach should be implemented. But surgical resection should be achieved properly in order to reduce the chances of recurrence. So operative principles that we all need to be aware of when we are dealing with Crohn's disease. So it is not curable disease. The complication of it are the most common indication for surgery. Operative options are influenced by a variety of factors as we mentioned earlier. Operative options are influenced by a variety of factors that they are all overlapping as we mentioned earlier. Asymptomatic disease should be ignored. Don't chase any disease because you don't want to resect an unnecessary um, part of the bowel. You don't want to conduct an unnecessary resection of part of the bowel because you don't want to induce short bowel syndrome. But in the same time, a non-diseased bowel may be involved by adhesions or fistulas, so you need to be aware of that and cognizant when you're conducting your surgery. Resection margins should be conservative, and I will explain that in a second. And mesenteric division can be challenging in Crohn's disease. So let's talk about each one. Failure of medical treatment. About 30 to 50% of patients operated upon presents because of failure of medical treatment. There is inadequate control of symptoms or steroid dependency or developing side effects of the medical therapy. Or they were having, they were receiving medical treatment, but their disease progressed. They, for example, they had a known mild grade stricture and they were taking a biologic. However, the stricture progressed while they were taking the medication. When you operate for these patients, the first thing you need to put in mind, A, I want to identify my anatomy, B, I want to identify pathology. So operative exploration is very important. As I said, other normal bowel may be involved with adhesions or fistulas, so rule out other occult unidentified pathology, such as the bystander fistula. A bystander fistula, when there is a, a disease, that you know, for example, there's a terminal ileum disease with a fistula with the cecum, but then you open the abdomen and you find that that disease is fistulizing with the sigmoid colon or descending colon or even the duodenum. Therefore, it is very important when the patient is evaluated in the, initially to conduct proper imaging like CT interrography or MRI interrography, as well as colonoscopy and EGD. Why? Because you want to know at this point, is the colon really diseased with Crohn's disease or the colon was normal on examination with, colo with a colonoscopy and biopsy? 
and it's just a bystander because this will dictate what you will do when you find such fistula. Same thing applies on the duodenum. If you go into a diseased, a severe disease, if you operate on an abdomen that's very hostile because of severe disease, you have to have an exit plan. If you cannot conduct your surgery safely, then you can just divert above the diseased area, put it out of circuit. Therefore, preoperative stoma marking is very important. That diversion gets the patient out of the diseased condition, out of sickness. You can try some medication, you can improve nutrition, and then you can come back later when you are ready. Surgical options include resection and restoration of GI continuity. We're going to think the same way we're thinking when we're talking about ulcerative colitis. If the patient is healthy, not on high dose of steroids, good nutrition condition, no problem, then you can resect and restore GI continuity in the same session. Alternatively, you can resect, restore the GI continuity, but you are not sure about the healing process, therefore you're going to protect it with diverting, proximal diverting ileostomy. Or if you are concerned about healing process, then you're going to resect without restoration of GI continuity and creation of end ileostomy and then come back later to restore continuity when the patient is doing better. Remember, asymptomatic disease is left alone. You cannot go and chase every part of the bowel unless it is symptomatic, otherwise you will cause trouble and you may induce short bowel syndrome. Now you find your anatomy, you identify your anatomy, you identify your pathology, and now you know how much to resect. So gross disease only, do not chase microscopic disease. And as, mat as a matter of fact, you may leave a residual microscopic disease behind. And when you open the lumen, a characteristic, the characteristic location of the aphthous ulcers and Crohn's disease are on the mesentery. So as this figure depicts here, where the disease is severe, the mesentery is thickened. When the disease starts, uh, or where the bowel starts to normalize grossly, not necessarily microscopically, when you try to pinch the mesentery between the thumb and the index finger, in the diseased area, they cannot meet, but in the normalized area, they will meet. And this is your resection margin. You can resect that, and once you open the bowel, you will find an aphthous ulcer about two centimeter proximal to the margin. That's okay. You can leave that. In a randomized prospective trial, conducted by Dr. Fazio, there was 152 resections of small bowel, and the resection was randomized to only 2 cm or 12 cm as resection margin, with a medium follow-up of 56 months. And indeed, extended resection margins conferred no advantage to patient in reducing cumulative recurrence rate in a disease that has potential for recurrence, potential for repeated resections. Hence, we all try to avoid short bowel syndrome. Therefore, asymptomatic disease should be left alone. Microscopic disease could be left behind and the resection margin um, are performed as I showed in the last slide. How to create the anastomosis? It could be end to end or end to side, side to side or side to end. There is a multitude of uh, ways to anastomose the bowel. You can do this hand sewn or stapled. You do the, pr the technique that you feel comfortable with as long as your leak rates are 
low and the recurrence are not high. However, if the bowel is hypertrophied and edematous and you are interested in um, anastomosing, the, anastomosing the bowel, then hand sewn is preferred in such condition and you can do it in one layer or two layers. Usually when we um, when we do hand sewn anastomosis, the mesenteric side we use a mattress vertical mattress suture and this suture enables you to create two layers in one stitch and the anti-mesenteric side we use a seromuscular suture. Be careful to avoid back walling and occlusion of the lumen. So you have to check your anastomosis uh, patency at the end of uh, suturing. And there had been studies that had been that uh, conducted to investigate any difference between hand sewn and staple anastomosis, and indeed there were no differences in regard to leak rates, endoscopic recurrence, or clinical recurrence. However, one has to emphasize a good technique and a wide patent anastomosis is needed. If you're going to do ileocolic anastomosis, remember, most likely the right colon had been uh, mobilized. We usually like to wrap the anastomosis with omentum. This acts as a biological barrier and keep the anastomosis away from the duodenum because Crohn's disease could be what? Could be fistulizing disease. So you don't want the anastomosis to fistulize with any surrounding organ. So the omentum is a natural barrier to help isolating the anastomosis from the surrounding hollow viscous. And about 20-25% of patients operated on with Crohn's disease are due to stricture disease. And we're going to talk about uh, lots of uh, operative techniques to treat stricture. Usually patients have obstructive symptoms, could be intermittent, um, associated with bloating, and could be just intolerance to certain type of foods according to where the stricture from mild to high grade uh, for, uh, results in intermittent to acute obstruction. That being said, it could be inflammatory stricture Basically, the bowel is inflamed, and when the bowel is inflamed, it's like a donut. The thickness of the bowel goes towards the inside, not the outside. Therefore, the lumen gets narrowed. Also consider if, if this patient had prior resection, then it could be the anastomosis that's getting strictured or malignancy. Proper imaging is very important. As you can see in the left-hand side here is a contrast imaging study with gastrographin that showed the tapered anastomosis with a pre-stenotic dilation and an MRE showing here the uh, high-grade stricture as well as some inflammation of the bowel next bowel loop next to the stricture that shows hyperemia here of the enhancement of the mucosa. If that was indeed inflammatory stricture, then it prompts an attempt of steroids therapy that it usually responds to and you can see and observe improvement on the patient condition. This also avoid emergent surgery it will allow you for further proper evaluation if you had evaluated the patient properly, including clinical imaging and endoscopic evaluation. And it may enable you to perform elective surgery with better perioperative and postoperative outcomes rather than immersion surgery. Fibrotic stricture, though, will require surgical intervention. However, it could be better if you can optimize the patient based on the factors mentioned before, specifically the nutrition uh, aspect of it. You can also try to decompress the patient to minimize the bowel dilation as well as an edema. And laparoscopic approach could be also uh, implemented in any of the uh, Crohn's disease uh, indications, even recurrent Crohn's disease. Strictoplasty 
had been used in Crohn's disease and other diseases for a long time. Usually, it is uh, used in jejunoileitis, which is the most common indication. It's an alternative for resection, and it can be done in index surgery. And it is used to preserve the, the length of the small bowel while maintaining function and absorptive capacity. All of this is to avoid the short bowel syndrome. Indication includes also rapid recurrence, patient that had previous recurrence, a non phlegmonous stricture, multiple strictures but in a long segment, and stricture after major surgery. Contraindications if there is poor nutrition well, that would risk the healing and put the patient at risk of leakage from uh, strictoplasty, sepsis and perforation, phlegmonous strictures, which basically the stricture is part of a phlegmon, therefore the tissues are not uh, pliable enough to be uh, sutured to each other, multiple strictures in a short segment. So when you're doing the strictoplasty, for example, the Heineke Michaelis strictoplasty, which I'm going to show in a second, you need to go one to two centimeters beyond the stricture. So if you have three strictures in 10 centimeters, each one of them is about three centimeter, then there's no space to perform appropriate strictoplasty in these three strictures. Also, if you're having a stricture near to a resection site, same thing, you're going to make anastomosis and then you're going to try to make strictoplasty, then you may have, you may end up having a small island of small bowel that can be at risk of ischemia. Types of strictoplasty includes Heineke Michelis, which are offered for strictures that are 10, 8 to 10 centimeters. Strictures who are 10 to 20 centimeters long can be dealt with by a uh, finis strictoplasty, and strictures more than 20 centimeters can be dealt with by the isoperistaltic side-to-side uh, strictoplasty uh, known as Michelassi strictoplasty. There are other forms of strictoplasty, but these are the most common forms that uh, um, encountered. The Heineke Michelis strictoplasty, again, you, and the anti mesenteric border, you uh, perform full enterotomy, full thickness enterotomy, and you extend about one to two centimeter on both sides of the stricture into a normal bowel, and then you close it horizontal. Regardless of the type of, uh, type of stitch you're going to use, uh, the closure and the technique has to be appropriate. Uh, I usually do seromascular suture. I don't include the mucosa. Some people will do cornel uh, and the, in the corners in order to help invert uh, the bowel wall um, and make the rest of the suturing uh, easy. Regardless, uh, a good technique is always important. The finis strictoplasty, as you can see, you fold, uh, you first of all, you uh, perform a full thickness entrotomy along the antimesenteric border of the stricture, extending one to two centimeter into a normal bowel. Then you fold the uh, stricture on itself, so it stands side to side, and then you perform a posterior wall, two layers uh, anastomosis, then an anterior wall, two layers anastomosis, and eventually it is closed uh, like this. Ultimately, you're basically creating a diverticulum. Stasis and stagnant succus could be a problem, but you have to weigh the benefits of the strictoplasty to avoid um, short bowel syndrome. The side-to-side -side isoperistaltic strictoplasty uh, is offered in strictures more than 20 centimeters, and you basically cut the stricture in the middle, you put the bowel next to each other, you trim the end, so you can create a posterior wall and anterior wall in a similar fashion.
as I was describing in Fini, but instead of the bowel is folded on itself, the bowel is basically placed uh, next to each other in an isoperistaltic fashion. And then it's closed. How about the adenal crows? It's very rare, but I thought it's worth mentioning. Um, the most frequent problem in the adenal crohn's is stricturing, and it results in obstructive symptoms. Endoscopic dilation is now used as first uh, modality of treatment, and if it fails, uh, surgery will follow. You can use a bypass or a JAPLA gastrogenostomy if the stricture is uh, hard, non pliable, and you cannot do proper cocorization of the duodenum. Or you can use Heineke Mikulich pyloroplasty as described earlier, or a fini form of pyloroplasty. So strictureplasty relieves obstruction in almost all the patients, and the majority of them will get off steroids. It has low post-operative complications, including leak, fistula abscess, and bleeding. In our experience in the Cleveland Clinic, is 9%. And septic complications are very low. And when compared strictureplasty to resection, there is a similar recurrence rate at the original site of the surgery. When we evaluated this in our uh, patient populations, there were about 28% of recurrence, but those were in other locations other than the strictureplasty. And ultimately, when indicated and properly implemented, there are no limits as to numbers of strictureplasty. How about anastomotic strictures? Again, depending on the presentation, this may require admission or could be treated as an outpatient. Endoscopic balloon dilation requires advanced endoscopists, and it is a good modality of treatment, but you need to understand that not every stricture uh, is amenable for endoscopic dilation. Long strictures will not uh, are not safe to dilate, so length of stricture is important to know. Uh, it can be performed in a single dilation versus repeated dilations, and it has a comp uh, spectrum of complication, but mainly you need to be aware of perforation and bleeding. If this fails, then surgical intervention uh, is prompted, and this requires a redo ileocolic anastomosis, and same concept apply as I uh, emphasized earlier. Fistulae will prompt surgery in about a quarter of patients with Crohn's disease. And the fistula could be between the small bowel and any surrounding hollow viscous, or could be anterior cutaneous fistula. Most common location that the fistula emanates from is the ileum. And anterior enteric fistulae are the most common pathology uh, encountered. It could be also um, found with a colon, vagina, bladder, or can even fistulize to the retroperitoneum and results in solus abscess. And as I mentioned earlier, the bystander fistula, which I'm going to talk about. One, th one other item I would like to discuss, which is surgery for symptomatic fistula. What, what does this mean? So, for example, a fistula that extends from terminal ileum to a closely adjacent loop of small bowel, and the patient is stable, eating well, no problem, no signs, maintained with medical therapy, then there is no necess necess necessity here that requires surgical intervention. On the other hand, a small fistula that bypass a long segment of the bowel, such as gastrocolic fistula, or a functional ileosigmoid fistula resulting in diarrhea, would more likely cause complications and require surgical intervention.
When fistulizing disease is terminal disease or end-stage disease, then this will require resection. And the same concept apply as described earlier about um, margin of resection, anastomosis versus anastomosis with diversion versus no anastomosis, resection, and diversion only. A bystander fistula can be encountered when you operate for a fistulizing disease. This fistula could be between the disease portion and any of the surrounding structures. Most common scenario we encounter is the ileosigmoid fistula. It may be not discovered in the initial workup, but the initial workup is very important to tell you if the colon is diseased or not diseased because you will know if the colon is partner in the crime or just an innocent bystander. Patient condition is very important because this will also uh, help in deciding resection versus resection anastomosis versus repair. If colon is primarily inflamed with poor tissue integrity, this is a large fistula, it's on the mesenteric side, then usually you need to resect the diseased part, including the fistula. If the colon is bystander, but the fistula is on the mesenteric side, you still want to resect that part in order to perform proper anastomosis. If the colon is bystander, and the fish is on the anti-mesenteric side that it is okay to do to perform wedge resection and primarily repair that part of the colon. Another very common presentation, especially specifically in young age patient population, is abscess. The patient would present with uh, with pre uh, acute abdominal pain. They go to the ED and the CT scan shows an abscess. These are treated in a in the same way when as if you are treating appendicular abscess. Try to control the sepsis. Attempt percutaneous CT guided drainage. Improve the patient and avoid emergent surgery. Antibiotics is used accordingly, of course. However, forty percent of these group of this group of patients will have associated fistula and surgery will ultimately be required. Again, you want to control the sepsis while you're evaluating the patient with imaging, endoscopic, if evaluate nutrition status, labs parameters, as well as medication. But many of these patients are actually presenting as first time with this presentation and identified and diagnosed at that health episode as having Crohn's disease. Don't forget stoma marking and proper surgical planning. If the patient, if a patient like this present to you and you perform CT guided drainage, then what's next? If the abscess is properly drained, you attempt feeding the patient. If this patient is one of the 40% that has associated fistula, in few days you will see bile coming from that drain. That's okay because you are still controlling the situation with your drainage. Then make the patient MPO. If the patient responded well to the feeding trial, then it's a matter of when to remove the drain and continue to evaluate the patient and perhaps he will respond or she will respond to medical treatment. Back to the beginning of the scenario, if the patient is malnourished, presented with severe disease, was in high dose of steroids, or had the bile, had the fistula with bile coming from the drain, then you can basically put the patient nil per os, bowel rest, hydration, initiate TPN to improve the patient condition, and proper planning for surgery. You can attempt diagnostic laparoscopy and see if you can perform this laparoscopically or better off 
be safe and you can approach these patients open. Because of the presence of sepsis and because of the presence of perforation, you may be reluctant to perform anastomosis. Therefore, you will perform resection and end ileostomy. Crohn's colitis is one of the um, areas that involves some debate in decision making. So, in brief, if somebody presents with Crohn's colitis, are we going to do total or segmental colectomy? Because this decision is basically related to the bowel function as well as bowel preservation in the background of disease recurrence. So, for example, if the patient has an isolated colonic disease, for example, there is a disease that involves the TI and the right side of the colon. So, it's iliocolonic L3. You can resect the TI and you can resect the right side of the colon according to the resection margin we discussed earlier. And you can restore GI continuity in the same time simultaneously or in a later fashion according to the patient general condition and the factors we discussed. However, it is important to emphasize that segmental colectomy is plugged by a higher recurrence rate. Same thing applies on the left side. So less than one third of the colon involvement, you are safe to conduct segmental colectomy as long as you explain to the patient that there is a higher risk of recurrence within three to five years. If the colon is more involved, but the rectum is spared, then you can perform total abdominal colectomy and ileorectal anastomosis, and this is the least forms of disease recurrence. Between 50 and 60% recurrence. Segmental colectomy sorry, segment, uh, isolated segmental colectomy is associated with more than 60% of recurrence. If the disease involved the rectum and the perineum as well, then total proctocolectomy and endoleostomy is indicated. So usually, if the patient is in between, has colonic disease, mild involvement of the rectum with the perianal fistula, then it is appropriate to perform total abdominal colectomy and ileostomy, secure the rectal sigmoid stump, as discussed earlier if the patient has poor condition, and then initiate a trial of medical treatment and evaluate the rectum. This is usually performed in a setting of multidisciplinary team approach involving your gastroenterologist with you and detailed discussion with the patient. Since we have discussed that Crohn's disease had a recurrent nature, then it is important to mention that medical prophylaxis is usually required after surgery because the cumulative risk of surgery in Crohn's disease is 16% at one year, 33% at five years, and almost 50% at 10 years. As a matter of fact, more than half of the patient will have had endoscopic recurrence at five years. Usually, after we perform resection and anastomosis, the gastroenterologist will perform an endoscopy at six months to evaluate the anastomosis and look for endoscopic recurrence. In the same procedure, biopsies are obtained to uh, evaluate the histologic condition of the lumen. Usually clinical recurrence following detection of endoscopic recurrence occurs somewhere between 30 and 45% in these patients. Factors associated with recurrence are smoking, penetrating behavior, fistulizing disease, extensive involvement of the small bowel, specifically the upper GI, presence of perianal disease, and prior resection. 
Speaking of perianal disease, I thought I would mention it because I think it's very important to know how to recognize it and how to deal with it until it is referred to the specialist. So perianal Crohn's disease occurs somewhere between 40 and 80% of patients. It can be the first sign of Crohn's disease could be perianal disease in 9 to 15% of patients. And that's why I wanted to mention something about perianal Crohn's disease. It's more associated with a distal bowel disease, so L2, clonic disease, mainly, as well as rectum, and less with small bowel disease. The common manifestations of perianal Crohn's disease include skin tags, fissures, ulcers, fistulas, abscesses, and strictures. If you look at this picture here, this is a typical picture. You can see the shiny skin, the waxy skin, and the hooded perianal skin tag with a fissure slash ulceration of the, uh, of the perianal area. This is a very typical Crohn's disease, perianal Crohn's disease. You need to know what to do when you see these patients and how to manage. The skin tag are most common manifestations followed by fistulae and multiple lesions may coexist together. In addition to lateral fissures, deep ulceration strictures and anovaginal fistulas. This is a depiction, or this is actually a picture of a uh, skin tag. You can see it is lateral, and it could be existing, not overlying a fissure, as opposed to the sentinel skin tag in normal population with history of uh, anal fissure. It looks like sometimes we describe it as elephant ear or hooded skin tag. The fissures are deep in Crohn's disease, larger, and they are not as painful as the general population anal fissures. This picture here you can see the fissure is anteriorly. This is patient this patient is in prone jackknife position. Here's anterior, here is posterior. And you can see atypical location of anal skin tag and it's not even overlying the anal fissure. Perianal Crohn's disease can be debilitating. This is another uh, presentation with severe infectious perianal Crohn's disease, including ulcerations, abscesses, and fistulae. So symptoms are widely varied, and because there is a subjective co perceiving component that differs between patients, so variable effect on quality of life, and it is also associated with scarring and fibrosis that may ultimately result in stenosis. And it usually requires a very good collaboration between the surgeon and the gastroenterologist because medical treatment may alter the course and change the progression, but not necessarily prevent the need for surgical intervention. The goals for anoperineal Crohn's disease treatment from the surgical perspective, you want to improve quality of life, you want to control the symptom, you want to avoid non-healing wounds, so less is more indeed in these situations. You also want to preserve continence and the intactness of the anal sphincter uh, muscle complex mechanism hopefully to avoid or at least delay the, necess the need for um, stoma. Examination under anesthesia is the first step. You want to have a good, reliable exam while the patient is comfortable. You're going to examine locally, but also you're going to use the scope to look at the rectum and the sigmoid, at least the rectum and the sigmoid colon to document that because you want to know the condition of these two areas and you will obtain biopsies. 
So if you have an abscess, then incision and drainage in the usual fashion is all what's needed until you either send this patient to a colorectal specialist and involve your gastroenterology colleagues and you want to preserve the sphincter mechanism. Alternatively, if a fistula is found, then proper drainage of any occult undrained sepsis is needed and placement of seton is all what's required in these situations. So abscess drainage, control the sepsis, resolution of symptoms, improving of quality of life, and allowing for further and proper evaluation of the patient and involvement of the proper specialists. There are no limits to how many cetons you can place. This uh, slide here shows how debilitating perianal fistula, fistulization of Crohn's disease can be, but it just requires patience, requires to know what you are dealing with, proper control of sepsis, and this may require multiple visits to the operative room, avoid large incisions and large wounds because these may not heal while the Crohn's disease is active. And eventually, if the disease will respond, then it may heal as the top left uh, picture here shows. But don't forget the goals. Now, the last section I'm going to talk about in inflammatory bowel disease is colitis-associated neoplasia. Both patients with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease are at increased risk of colorectal carcinoma. In this patient population, carcinoma can occur earlier. There is also a synchronous neoplasia that may exist and this may not be identified. And that's the scary part about it. There is also high potential of metachronous development neoplas uh, uh, development of metachronous neoplasia. And 15% of inflammatory bowel disease patients may die from colorectal carcinoma. Although found predominantly in areas of inflammation, be cognizant of the fact that inflammation, um, neoplasia, including dysplasia and cancer, may occur away from areas of inflammation. Like sporadic colorectal cancer, IBD-associated colorectal carcinoma involves P53 and adenomatous polyposis coli mutations and microcytolite instability. However, the sequence of these mutations in progressive malignant degeneration is different between IBD-associated malignancy and conventional colorectal cancer. If you see here, APC mutations are involved in the first step in sporadic cancer while APC mutation in IBD is involved relatively late in the progression from inflammation to carcinoma. It's also important to know that the conventional pathway involves low-grade dysplasia, high-grade dysplasia, then carcinoma. And it usually occurs over a course of somewhere between 7 and 10 years. In IBD, this progression is unpredictable, so you can find low-grade dysplasia, and after that you can find carcinoma. Actually, you can have low-grade dysplasia with an unrecognized, unidentified, coexisting cancer. So there is no order sequence of events in IBD, and it occurs over a shorter duration of time. A rule of thumb is the risk of developing colorectal cancer in chronic ulcerative colitis is between 0.5 and 1% per year after the first 8 to 10 years of disease. At 10 years, the risk is 2%. It is 8% at 20 years, which is very high. 
18% after 30 years of disease. Currently, it is recommended to conduct surveillance colonoscopy at eight, after 8 to 10 years of onset of symptoms, not diagnosis. A patient who was diagnosed after 4 years of symptoms, 4 year reators is re required to have surveillance endoscopy because if you apply 8 year rule from diagnosis time, this is 12 years of symptoms which puts him at risk of developing and harboring carcinoma. However, colorectal cancer may occur within the first eight years window of the disease. Therefore, a low threshold for repeating endoscopy um, should exist. Factors associated with increased risk of neoplasia include young age at diagnosis, duration of disease, extent of disease and severity of disease, family history of colorectal cancer, as well as primary sclerosing cholangitis. Surveillance colonoscopy involves full colonoscopy, including intubating the ileum, as we discussed earlier, and then obtaining random biopsies, which are four quadrant biopsies every 10 centimeters. Or you can do eight random biopsies from the right colon, eight from the transverse colon, eight from the descending, and then the rectum. Any lesion, any suspected lesion should be either biopsied or resected. And any stricture should be biopsied, specifically in Crohn's disease. However, biopsying stricture in IBD may have false negative, so it's inadequate to rule out carcinoma. And it's indicative of Crohn's disease. If a sporadic polyp or a polyp is found in colitis, then the polyp should be removed with the appropriate technique, either biopsy forceps or snare, according to the size and the features of the polyp. However, biopsy from the surrounding mucosa that surrounds the base of the polyp should be obtained to identify if this polyp is arising in inflamed area or that's just a sporadic polyp that could happen if that patient was not diagnosed as a colitic patient, either ulcerative colitis or Crohn's colitis. So because this will differentiate what to do next. Adenoma, by definition, guys, is low-grade dysplasia. So when you say tubular adenoma, you are saying that's low-grade dysplasia. So you need to identify if this tubular adenoma is sporadic adenoma or arising in a background of inflamed tissue because this may prompt you to perform colectomy versus surveillance. Because of that, a more targeted endoscopic modalities have been developed to be more accurate and more precise. One of these modalities is chromoendoscopy, where dilute methylene blue is sprayed onto the mucosa using a standard endoscope. It's time consuming, but it has a higher rate of detecting adenomas. Narrowband imaging, which basically a filter narrows the white line to blue and green. The capillaries in the mucosa surface absorb the blue and reflect it as brown. And the deeper and larger vessels in below the mucosa absorb the green band and reflect it as blue. And therefore, the, gastroendos the gastroendoscopist may see more subtle lesions that are not seen with the white light endoscopy. So the indication of surgical intervention 
in colitis ulcerative neoplasia includes multifocal low-grade dysplasia, high-grade dysplasia or multifocal high-grade dysplasia, flat lesions, and these all prompt surgical resection. At least 20 to 30 percent of these patients will harbor occult carcinoma and more than 50% of these patients will develop cancer within five years. Choice of operation. If we are talking about ulcerative colitis patient, then the whole colon and rectum needs to be removed ideally. As we discussed earlier, total proctocolectomy and ileostomy, or with restoration of GI con gastrointestinal continuity uh, with ileal pouch and anastomosis. And then you can discuss two stage versus three stage depending upon the patient presentation. If the patient was having a quiescent disease and that was just surveillance, you can perform that in a two stage safely. If the patient was on significant amount of medication to get the disease under control and part of the workup slash investigation uh, a dis dis high grade dysplasia was encountered then three stage procedure is warranted if the patient with dysplasia has Crohn's colitis then it is if it is localized to the colon then total abdominal colectomy with high ligation of the Iliocolic, middle colic, as well as inferior mesenteric arteries is, prompt, uh, is prompted. Same thing applies on the ulcerative colitis patient as well. If the rectum is involved, then total proctocolectomy with the same uh, surgical principles. You may consider ileal pouch in anastomosis in Crohn's disease patient with isolated disease the anus and the perineum are completely free of disease, normal bowel, normal small bowel, and the patient is motivated, understanding that Crohn's disease may activate and may, the patient may end up losing the pouch and living with permanent ileostomy. If the rectum is involved in ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease and the patient is going to have ileal pouch, then we perform the protectomy in it and mucosectomy. We don't leave the anal transition zone. We take the mucosa out, so basically we can take any sort of um, at-risk cells that could, potent, could, could represent the potential of uh, developing carcinoma, and we perform hand-sewn pouch anal anastomosis. That being said, opponents of that technique say that even with performing mucosectomy, islands of mucosa may be left behind that are not uh, shown clearly to the surgeon eyes, and this may harbor foci of uh, dysplasia slash carcinoma later on. Also, these patients will require annual pouchoscopy and random biopsies from the pouch and the ATZ if, if it is left to rule out development of dysplasia. I hope that presentation um, summarized the extensive information about inflammatory bowel disease and I hope the information I brought and I put in would help you in to further understand ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease and how to deal with these patients uh, when they present in the clinic or when you are consulted uh, on them in the hospital uh, and how you can follow up these patients and how you can make a decision about when to operate and what surgery you offer them and um, diversion versus no diversion.